Hey everyone, it's early April 2024, and in this video we see that the Artemis II Orion spacecraft is being ready to begin altitude chamber testing, which marks a production milestone, while NASA and Lockheed Martin continue to work the root cause corrective actions process for recent issues. This was the first good look at the mated spacecraft that will take the four-person astronaut crew around the moon next year. The day before the Orion was moved into the altitude chamber, NASA and Aerojet Rocketdyne completed the last planned certification test firing of an RS-25 development engine in support of production restart for the engine. This concludes over five dozen hot fire tests conducted across over six years of time to help validate that the production lines are certified to build new RS-25 engines that will begin flying on Artemis V. And the space agency selected three commercial groups to continue studies to build and deliver a lunar terrain vehicle to the moon for autonomous use and for use by future Artemis crews. Let's take a look, beginning with the Orion for Artemis II. Orion prime contractor Lockheed Martin moved the Artemis II spacecraft into an altitude chamber on Thursday, April 4th at its production site. The Artemis II Orion quote-unquote short stack, which is the mated crew and service modules, also mated to the spacecraft adapter cone, that's located in the Neil Armstrong Operations and Checkout Building in the Kennedy Space Center Industrial Area. Lockheed Martin's Orion Assembly, Test, and Launch Operations, or ATLO for short, is working on production in the Industrial Operations Zone, IOZ for short, in the ONC building. The service module and SA cone were first installed in the final assembly system test, or fast cell, last year, and then the crew module was brought over and mated to the service module last October, October 19th, to begin integrated testing. NASA Public Affairs posted a set of stills on Thursday afternoon showing the lift of the spacecraft from the fast cell to the altitude chamber. A few went up on social media first, and then a larger set showed up on the NASA Orion Flickr page. Taking a look at the images in that first set of four, in the first shot, the spacecraft short stack has almost been lifted up out of the fast cell, with the bottom of the SA cone not quite yet above the railings. You can see the red covers over the visible RCS jets and the posts where the two of the solar arrays will eventually be mounted. The protective covers over the crew module backshell panels are gone now, and we can see the reflective tape that covers the thermal protection system tiles for the backshells. In the next image, we see that the crane has moved the spacecraft out into the aisleway of the IOZ and is being moved towards a camera position. In the third image, we're now looking in more or less the opposite direction. The fast cell is just out of view to the right. The spacecraft is being lifted up near the ceiling as it is moved towards the renovated altitude chamber. There are two chambers, only one of them was renovated. In the last image of the set, we're now at the top of the altitude chamber and the spacecraft short stack is being lowered inside. Other images taken during the operation provide a little more coverage of the initial lift out of the fast cell and the move of the spacecraft on the crane down the aisleway and over towards the altitude chamber. Public Affairs indicated that they expect to release B-roll video next week and possibly some additional images. Earlier in the week, prior to the move, my story for NSF on the two new Orion issues that were made public in January was published. The issues forced the target launch date for Artemis II to be pushed back to September 2025. That delay was announced on January 9th, and there wasn't enough time to get to many media questions on that date. It took until late March to get an opportunity to ask my questions. I interviewed Amit Shatria, NASA Deputy Administrator for the Moon to Mars program, and the story goes in depth into what he said. As I outlined in the status update video that I published last week, the bottom line is that the Orion program is still working through those issues, along with the performance of the heat shield during the Artemis 1 reentry. 
The issue with the faulty circuit design used in some digital motor controllers on the spacecraft came up first, and the Orion program and prime contractor Lockheed Martin are closer to the end of the corrective actions for that. They have repaired, replaced, bypassed, or developed workarounds for the components affected by the issue. For the issue with the spacecraft battery that failed a component-level qualification test, the program is testing repairs and deciding on replacement options. The battery was subjected to the shock it would see in a worst-case abort scenario, with the hypothetical of the launch vehicle becoming suddenly and extremely out of control. NASA and Lockheed Martin are still working through the root cause corrective actions process for that issue, but they determined that the testing and the altitude chamber can go ahead. The spacecraft will go through two test series in the chamber. First, electromagnetic interference slash compatibility, EMI slash EMC tests will be performed. Then vacuum testing is currently planned to begin in early July. The plan is for Orion to be moved back to the fast cell for additional work in between those tests. After the vacuum testing in the altitude chamber in the summer, the spacecraft will again return to the fast cell. The original plan was to finish installation of the remaining hardware, in particular the solar array wings and the service module fairing panels. But it remains to be seen what the resolution is for the battery issue in particular, but also perhaps the heat shield issue, what retesting will need to be completed, and what the schedule for that looks like. It's possible that there's enough time in between the EMI EMC tests and the vacuum tests to make the corrective actions on the spacecraft batteries for that issue, but that depends on when the Orion program is ready to do that. We'll have to see if there's any better clarity either when the spacecraft completes the EMI EMC tests and comes out of the chamber or when it goes back in before the vacuum tests in the early summer. The final hot fire test in the RS-25 production restart program was completed on Wednesday, April 3rd at Stennis Space Center in the Fred Hayes test stand, formerly known as the A1 test stand. Engine 0525 was fired for 500 seconds in this 12th and final hot fire in the Retrofit 3B series. Aerojet Rocketdyne, an L3 Harris Technologies company, will be working with the SLS liquid engines element to finish certification of the upgraded engine design and manufacturing process ahead of the first planned use of flight engines on Artemis 5, which is currently scheduled for no earlier than 2030. NASA transferred 16 flight space shuttle main engines and two development engines from the shuttle program to SLS after the space shuttle was retired in 2011. That was enough hardware to both certify operating the SSME under SLS flight conditions and to supply enough engines to outfit four core stages. That testing, called RS-25 adaptation testing, adaptation from shuttle to SLS, was completed a long time ago, in October of 2017. The first set of flight engines was expended on Artemis 1, and the agency plans to use the rest of the flight engines on Artemis 2, 3, and 4. Production restart testing began immediately thereafter in late 2017 with the Retrofit 1A series. That was followed by Retrofit 1B, Retrofit 2, and Retrofit 3A with the two shuttle development engines, 0525 and 0528. Then a full build of newly manufactured production restart engine hardware was assembled into engine 10001 and hot fired in the certification test series before engine 0525 came back for Retrofit 3B to close out the hot fire testing part of certification. I went through the production restart testing history up to this final series in more depth in a recent video. I'm linking that above in case you're interested in checking that out. When it was inherited from the Space Shuttle program, Engine 0525 had SSME Block 2 components on it, and aside from the new engine controller and engine control software that was introduced and certified for flight during the adaptation test series from 2015 through most of 2017, it was pretty much using shuttle-era hardware. Now, at the end of the different test series, 
for production restart, most of the SSME hardware has been retrofitted with new components coming off of Aerojet Rocketdyne's component production lines. The prime contractor doesn't build fully assembled engines on the production lines. It builds mostly interchangeable components like pumps, valves, ducts, injectors, and manifolds. Those are then shipped to Stennis for final assembly. One of the quote-unquote things demonstrated in these last two certification test series was taking the first new production restart nozzle off of the certification engine 10001 and installing it on engine 0525. About the only things that weren't planned to be replaced were the hot gas manifold and the three injectors, the two pre-burners and the main injector at the center of the engine powerhead. Almost everything else on engine 0525 was replaced across the years and test series. The engine goes through a few hours of preparations in the test stand before it is ready to start. It goes through chill down and purge sequences prior to the final few minutes before start, and then there's a sequence like we heard a little bit of during the Artemis 1 launch countdown and post-launch releases of material. There's a final purge sequence, purge sequence 4, and the engine controller indicates that the engine is ready to start once the engine parameters are within their start box. There's an auto sequence that is started, though it's different for a single engine ground test than for the four engine cluster on the SLS vehicle. In the final test in the Retrofit 3B series last Wednesday, we see that the engine start command was issued at about 12.23.21 local or central time, which was 17.23.21 UTC. The engine starts to 100% and then in this test throttles up to a high power setting. As we note often, few test details are disclosed, including the throttle profile so we don't know if the engine throttled up to 111% or 113%. The next view of the engine that reveals the shock diamond, which shows the throttling, shows that it throttled to its 80% or minimum power level, and after several seconds it throttles up to a high or maximum power level. The pre-test numbers we did get were that the engine would be throttled as high as 113%, and that the duration of the test was planned for 500 seconds. We saw views through the test of the large steam cloud generated by the engine firing into a water deluge of the test stand's flame bucket. That water is vaporized by the engine exhaust and we see that from a fixed ground camera and from a drone. About 50 seconds before shutdown we got another look at camera 442 and we saw the engine throttle back to an intermediate power level somewhere around 100%. It then throttles back up to that max power level at about 10 seconds before shutdown, and then the engine is shut down from there. As I noted in the video that covered the last hot fire test, typically the engine is shut down from the minimum power level of 80%, which is a little gentler on the components. But the engine components are being certified again, and the engine is designed to be able to shut down safely from anywhere in its operating range. And so this was a demonstration as with the last test, that the engine can shut down from a high power level or a max power level if necessary. Media was invited to Stennis ahead of the test, but on only six days' notice, which was too steep a cost for cross-country travel when I'm working with a shoestring budget. Media in attendance did get to see RS-25 and SLS-related facilities at Stennis, and I saw YouTube videos from WLOX-TV and the Associated Press the evening of the test, in case you're interested in looking for those. I also contacted Aerojet Rocketdyne about what's next, and here are those notes. First, Aerojet Rocketdyne's production lines are busy building the components for the Artemis V flight engines and beyond. The hardware for the first flight engine is already at Stennis and is being assembled at the 9101 facility there. The plan is for that first flight engine to be acceptance tested in the Fred Hayes test stand later in the year. The current forecast is the fall time frame. Plans are to continue using all three development engine sets for future ground tests, so not just the certification engine 10001, but the two shuttle era development engines 0525 and 0528. 
As noted previously, most of their Shuttle Aero hardware has been replaced with new components coming off the restarted RS-25 production lines. On Wednesday, April 3rd, NASA announced that they had selected three lunar terrain vehicle proposals for a year-long feasibility study. At some point after that, they will select one of them for a demonstration mission in which the commercial awardee would develop the unpressurized lunar vehicle, deliver it to the lunar surface at the moon's south pole, and then operate it uncrewed until the next Artemis mission. The goal is for the LTV to be operating on the surface before the Artemis V mission lands there, but budget is already a factor. There's only enough money expected right now to make a single demonstration award, and given the current budget situation where NASA's funding is capped and declining slightly, it could fall on the commercial awardee to make up shortfalls to the operating plans and schedule. In the news briefing after the study awards were announced, Laura Kearney, manager of NASA's Extravehicular Activity and Human Surface Mobility Program, noted that the goal would be for the demonstration mission to be available to support Artemis V, but it is not necessarily tied to that landing. So I'll ask, answer the second um, part. So again, under this contract, they have proposed their own mechanism for landing on the moon. So it is not really tied to the Artemis human missions. Um, our objective and our plan is to have an LTV on the surface prior to the Artemis V crew arrival. Um, if they can get there earlier, we'll take it earlier. If it's there for the Artemis IV crew, all the better. And certainly as soon as it's on the surface, it can start doing unmanned teleoperated science. So, so again, we're not fundamentally linked and tied to the, a specific Artemis mission necessarily. Um, as far as... Given the current budget situation and the technology development involved, it seems like it is going to be challenging to meet the Artemis V schedule goal, similar to the schedule challenges that all the other Artemis programs are currently facing. Thanks for watching another update on Artemis News. If you're interested in a deep dive into the production status for hardware that will fly on the next three Artemis missions, Artemis 2, 3, and 4, a link to that video will show up YouTube style in the last 20 seconds. We're about a month away from the five-year anniversary of NASA's reveal of the Artemis brand name by then Administrator Jim Bridenstine. We'll see what's next this year with preparations for Artemis 2, development of new technologies for Artemis 3, 4, and beyond, and the problematic budget situation.